This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I'm a writer and film critic and today I am delighted to be talking to Graham Skipper who is the author of a new book, Godzilla, the official guide to the King of the Monsters. This is a book which has been commissioned by Toho, the company behind Godzilla, originally founded in 1932. It has produced a whole series of movies including the Godzilla movies. Graham is a writer, an actor, a director, a producer. He's made his own horror movies, such as Sequence Break. He's written a a book of essays uh, for Fangoria and um, My Favourite Horror uh, Book. He has also um, appeared in the Reanimator, the musical, as Herbert West himself for Stuart Gordon, the late lamented Stuart Gordon. And uh, he's written an, an amazing book. I mean, he's, uh, there's no one more qualified than Graham to write upon, upon this subject. And this is a beautiful book, got l- loads of great photographs in it and it gives you a film by film guide to a genre which is uh, is really um loved by many and if you haven't uh, dipped into it if you haven't ever watched a godzilla movie then then this book's kind of a really good way of starting because it it, it will it will definitely give you a way in um, to what is a fascinating and, and entertaining genre. If you enjoy the episode, please remember to like and subscribe and do all those things I ask you to do. Should I stop asking you to do it? Is it a bit boring for me to, you know? I was thinking the other day when I was listening back to an episode that maybe I repeat myself too much. Maybe I've become a little bit too formulaic um in in saying certain things so um yeah let me know let me know if you think i should shake it up a little bit and be a little bit looser it's just a way of trying not to say um too much i guess if you have a sort of script in your head you can just you know ride that without having to to worry too much about actually having to think about what you're saying but that doesn't necessarily make for the most compelling less listening experience so yeah you let me know about that that'd be an interesting any any feedback you have would be interesting we're heading towards a hundredth episode now so um uh yeah always looking looking towards shaking things up and making it more enjoyable oh on another little bit of personal news before we get to, to our conversation with graham um i'm setting up and developing a new podcast which is going to be about italian cinema and will hopefully offer you a kind of guided tour of the worlds of Italian cinema and I'm going to look at everything from giallo to spaghetti western to neorealism to silent movies white telephone films the whole the whole gamma the whole range of um of Italian cinema so um that should be coming out in the next few weeks uh it's in the process of development at the moment approaching guests recording episodes and everything uh so that's something uh i hope that you will be interested in too before any of that enjoy the conversation I was I was in Reanimated the Musical. Yeah, Stuart uh, Stuart Gordon directed it. Um, right. He became became a very close friend, and I I played Herbert West. Wow. Um, did it for uh, about four years, and it's sort of what got me. It's not sort of it is what got me into the uh, horror business. It's kind of where I met everybody. It's where I met Joe Vegas. Joe was the uh, uh, stage manager on that show, mm. and so that's mm. where we where we met. Brilliant, brilliant, and congratulations on the book. I really, uh, I really Thanks enjoyed so it. Thank you. Um, I had, I, I have to admit, and yeah, again, in a, in a way, this is sort of like a perfect thing for the for a perfect reader for the book. My knowledge of um, Godzilla is restricted to the very first movie, and okay. the, the sort of later American remakes and the and the cartoon when we were we were kids with godzuki and all that stuff (laughs) but your book made me really go i've got to watch some of these other (laughs) good good well that's the goal that's the goal what was your uh, first experience of godzilla when i was i mean i was probably five or six years old um 
my grandparents, they, you know, had a house out in the country and we would go there every other weekend or so. Um, and they had, if this was ever as popular over in, in Europe, it might've been, um, these, these huge satellite dishes in the backyard, mm -hmm. um, back in like the early days of like satellite TV. So they had this huge satellite dish that would pick up all the channels that, that it could. So like it picked up HBO, even though they didn't pay for it, it picked up you know, all the, you know, all, all the other sort of pay channels that we didn't have. And on HBO, I remember distinctly, they had one TV and it was a little bitty TV in their bedroom. Mm. Um, and it was up on the wall. And uh, I, I would just sit in there and watch whatever was on TV. And I saw coming up next on HBO was King Kong versus Godzilla. And I remember thinking, and this is one of my earliest memories. I remember thinking, well, I, I, I know who King Kong is and I know who Godzilla is and I like monsters, and so I'm probably going to like this, you mm -hmm. know, and so I watched it and I just loved it. And then my whole thing, you know, back then HBO played Godzilla movies all the time. So that was whenever I go visit them, I just sit back there and just wait for Godzilla movies to come on. They'd have and them like became... on, on in rotations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, you know, you kind of knew the time of day on. It was, it was a blast. I, I just, I loved it from the very beginning and I loved all the toys. And like I said, I've always been a monster kid. And so it was really just, I don't know, it was just kind of like a perfect mixture of things for me. Cause I was also a scaredy cat and they weren't that scary, you mm. know, like mm. I, I liked monsters, but I was afraid also. So like Frankenstein and the Wolfman and stuff like that stuff scared me a little too much, but Godzilla, it was fun, but it was still a monster. So I think that's, you know, kind of why I fell in love with it. Are you still uh, are you still scared? Because I I I'm a big horror fan, but I'm uh, absolutely terrified <laughs> for horror films, <laughs> and that's kind of um, that's my thrill, you know. But I'm not jaded. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm jaded. I I enjoy them. I mean, there's certainly some films that that scare me. I mean, Hereditary is the one that pops into my head most recently that really genuinely scared me. Mm. Um, I I get very scared by horror video games. You know, hor horror movies don't tend to scare me as much anymore, but horror video games, uh, they really get me. But yeah, so I, I mean, I still get scared. I mean, that's why I, you know, I, I love them is because either they're going to be like a comfort blanket or they're going to be fun or they're going to be something that I know I'm going to enjoy. Or it might be something that actually gives me a thrill, which, you know, you're always chasing that dragon. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so when you're watching these Godzilla movies, you're watching presumably a, the sort of American versions that that I, it was really interesting in your book as you sort of talk about the Japanese ones first. And then in America, they put in a couple of, you know, Raymond Burr turns up or something and you throw in a few newscasters and then uh, uh, and cut out some plots and stuff. So which, which version are you watching on HBO? So back then it was the American version. So the Japanese right. version of the original Godzilla uh, wasn't available in the U.S. until something like 2004. Wow. Um, it was it was way, way, way later uh, that anybody in America was able to see that. Now, I'm sure, um, you know, in like in Europe or something, if I had been a an astute film kid, you know, and had gone to Germany or something, I could have found the original one. But yeah, but it, it none of those were available really until the 2000s. And a lot of them weren't available uh, easily until like the Criterion set that came out. Like I hadn't seen the original Japanese version of King Kong versus Godzilla until until the Criterion set came out when I watched it, and uh, and I I vastly prefer the the original. I mean, the I, I have a great affinity for the American version, um, but it's just so interesting to me to watch to to watch the original versions of these films and and see what were changed, you know what what things were changed and and try to understand why, you know, mm. like with the original Gojira, I mean, the idea of adding Raymond Burr is essentially to one, give an American voice and two, to, to, to sort of provide uh, like context and, and narrative, like link narrative description for what they thought was going to be a stupid American audience, you know, well, they're not going to know what's going on. So we got to tell them, you know, and then there's also this added layer of like American kind of, machoism of like we're gonna kill this monster you know mm. in the japanese version it's a lot more you know dour and and tragic uh but it's not so much about like how amazing the military is it's about how unstoppable this force is 
Mm. Um, and they sort of recontextualize that a little bit for the Americans. For King Kong versus Godzilla, I actually find, and I want to say too that I, I don't mind the Raymond Burr version. It's a di- they, they still keep a lot of the soul of it. And I actually think the craft of being able to realistically insert Raymond Burr into these scenes and, and, you know, and they do that a lot now, like in the, it was funny. I was watching the, uh, the new fast and furious 10 trailer and, and where they essentially insert Jason Momoa into scenes from part five that he was never actually in. I was like, Oh, they're doing a Raymond Burr. Like that's what they did with (laughs) Raymond Burr and Godzilla. But with King Kong versus Godzilla, the original Japanese is very funny. It's very cartoony. It's big. It's it's uh, extremely satirical. Um, they really lean into kind of the slapsticky nature of the humor. And in the American version, they take it. It takes itself a bit more seriously, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of to its detriment. Because if you the American version to me is a little, it's a little hokey, and it's a little like you know, there's no way to really make these two monsters the way that they're designed in this movie look cool i mean to a five-year-old they're cool but watching it now it's like they're not they're not cool it's a little goofy you know it takes itself too seriously and at least in the original japanese you can see the original vision was one really sending up uh the satirical or or, or really satirizing you know the the commercial entertainment business um in in a way that leaned very heavily into the comedy Uh, and i just think it works better it's interesting when you say that as well that at the very beginning you, you you're talking as well about the 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 fact that this is coming out of a, a, a Japan post-war Japan which has been traumatized by the nuclear um, attacks on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and and yet at the same time they're looking at this massive destruction happening with Godzilla and they're doing it in a satirical way in a way which isn't necessarily taking itself too seriously because it it seems to have at its core at something which is incredibly tragic and yet and yet it's being dealt with and played with in a way which is uh contains humor yeah well I mean Godzilla you know a- after the original film which which was a uh, uh, one just a gigantic massive success um mm. you know locally in Japan and then globally um you know they 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 were obviously exploring these themes of of the bomb and of their relationship with the bomb and this kind of very Japanese sensibility of like of like we are partially to blame for what happened and how do we as a as a as a nation and as a cultural identity like how do we how how do we deal with that and how do we accept responsibility while also mourning the deaths of all of these civilians and and so that's what Gojira is all about but then you get into you know the first sequel Godzilla raids again and then certainly then with King Kong versus Godzilla and and I think what they did which again is a very unique Japanese concept where they then accept this this thing this creation and then turn it into a a cultural identity they they turn that into an icon that represents them and so then Godzilla starts to shift away from being a menace to being a friend you know, and he doesn't really fully become like a friend until Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. You know, he's he's generally always kind of a, a menace up until then, but he's but it becomes they become funnier, they become more kid friendly. Um, they they start to emphasize other messages um, of of you know ecological sustainability and like whatever it is in each film. But yeah, I, I think that it's because the Japanese then said all right we've created this monster that and that now becomes our our totem our icon that we own and and it can become a good thing and so what if we're able to turn this thing that was once bad into a protector and a friend of japan and that's really what they did you know in each of the eras of the films they sort of reset and they kind of re-explore that in new contexts every time um but i just find it really uh, you know amazing and you touched on it with what you said of how how they they you know the first film is such a stark dire horrific um examination of 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 the nuclear bomb and of the aftermath of that and then they were able to that then that character evolves into something that is not just a friend of humanity you know but is is practically a saturday morning cartoon is a friend of kids you know mm. kids hug onto their Godzilla dolls and love their Godzilla toys. I mean, they even, you know, they play with that and, and, you know, like Godzilla versus Megalon, like the, you know, the, the kid has Godzilla toys, you know, even in the universe, the kids love Godzilla. 
And so I think it's just, it's about, you know, I mean, it, it, this is a way oversimplification, but it's like turning lemonade, you know, out of lemons, mm. right? It's, mm, it's yeah. you, you take something bad and you turn it into something good. And I think that's what Godzilla represented for a lot of people. I mean, I guess it's sort of something that happens quite generally with horror as well, isn't it? You know, uh, the Freddy of the first Nightmare on Elm Street film is a like a murderous pedophile, and and you're kind of, you know, and by the second third one, he's a kind of more kind of cartoonish sort of anti-hero who who you're you're kind of watching the films for the purpose of seeing how's he going to kill the next person, you know? Um, yeah. So so you kind of have to, you can't just keep hating on someone if that's the reason you're going to the cinema to, to see them. You, you've got to. Sure. Go. Yeah. You need to root, you need to root for them. Yeah. You know, and I think, and I think like examples like Freddie and Jason, obviously they're a little bit different because they're still the antagonists. But even then you look at like, you know, in, in like Friday the 13th part six, you know, which is essentially an out and out like comedy, you know, it's mm. a, it's a send up of universal movies. Now, is Jason, like, protecting the people? No. Like, I think that's where it differs with Godzilla, where, you know, Godzilla, you know, the the there is still a bad, you know, it would be sort of the same as if, like, I don't know, if if uh, in Freddy versus Jason, if Freddy showed up and all of a sudden Jason was protecting the kids. Uh, but, but yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that you, over the course of all of these different, the, these franchises, and especially with Godzilla, um, they, they definitely evolve in such a way to where, you are um you're you're really rooting for him and you are excited when he shows up not because he's going to destroy everybody but because he's he's going to help you i mean that's that's like kind of the whole premise of godzilla versus mecha godzilla is mm. that godzilla shows up and he's bad and holy shit you know and and his he beats up Inguiris, one of his best monster friends and even Inguiris is like holy shit you know what's going on well, it's revealed that it's not really Godzilla, that's Mecha Godzilla. So even <laughs> baked into the the substance of these later movies, uh Godzilla being bad becomes such a foreign concept that it's like horrific when he shows up and he's doing bad things. Um, it just becomes a totally, a totally different uh uh film, and the people are just horrified, going, I can't believe Godzilla's bad. You know, and you think back <laughs> to the original film, it's like, wow, you know. <laughs> How far we have come. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so when you start getting these different monsters coming in, and you, you'll have to help me with the pronunciation because the Japanese word for them is kujuru. Is that right? Uh, kai, kaiju. 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 Okay. So when you get these yeah. kaiju coming in, uh, first of all, I guess, I mean, it's a bit of a basic question, but what's your favorite of the kaiju? Oh, um, gosh. I mean, probably Mothra. I mean... Right. You know, I love I love Mothra. Um, <laughs> I, I, I you know Mothra is you know the Earth Mother. Mothra is always uh, a a good a good character, mm. um, even from the beginning. Uh, I probably Mothra. I mean, I, I love all of them. I love Ghidorah. Uh, you know, Ghidorah is is just always scary, um, and I love a good you know he G Ghidorah really is like the sort of epitome of what. Of of the of a villain for Godzilla, it's the mm. true match. Yeah, I mean, I love all of them. You know, it's interesting because a lot of these kaiju that come in, they already had their own franchises. So, right. like Mothra in had the his wake own of, movie. yeah, Moth yeah, Mothra had her own movie. Uh, Rodan had her own series. The Rodan series is actually very good, very scary. Uh, Ghidorah, I don't believe did, um, but yeah, like you know, it was truly kind of the first. You know, when we think of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all these characters sort of coming into other movies, you know, this was the progenitor of all of them. And it was all because Toho, one, saw the value of creating new series of movies. And then with all the ones that they owned, they they were able to, to you know, throw these popular characters together, which is why King Kong versus Godzilla came about, because they had the rights to King Kong. You know, mm -hmm. and and that I mean that like like in Godzilla raids again, he had fought Inguiris, who was just a creation that they made up for that movie, um, but became a very popular character. King Kong Godzilla, that was the first time that two really iconic actors like that from two different, you know, film franchises were, you know, put together in a movie. And it was I mean, it, it it was like the Avengers of that. It was the hu hugest movie in the world. It was gigantic, you know, and and that and that really laid the scene for 
for moving forward of them of them realizing how much people love that and i mean down to you know many, some of the monsters uh are, were created by um like uh contests you know they would have contests like a school children contest to create right. a new monster that's where jet jaguar came about you know so uh so they they had fun with it they they've learned how to have fun with it and uh and and it it became a hallmark of of why that series has now lasted for you know going on 70 years i was i was about to say that as my my next question really was it in terms of how it relates to the sort of the idea of a cinematic universe with with uh the avengers and marvel and what have you but you've you've uh you've already asked and answered as the as the lawyers would say (laughs) yeah um so I mean, as you go, the way you divide the, you organize the book is is you you're giving a very good chronology and you're dividing it into phases um, in terms of the sort of uh, Japanese imperial sort of history as it goes. Uh, but you're, it's really interesting as you see creators moving in and moving out and and how the tone changes. And, and it's I, I found it interesting how it gets more serious as you get into the 80s and 90s. Um, why why do you think that was? Uh, good question. Um, I think that, well, one, you know, a hallmark that you see of every time that an era resets, you know, when they take a break and then come back, they all tend to want to come back with, okay, Godzilla's scary again. Right. You know, let's go back to that. And and we see that in, when you think the... Um, like kind of any any remake of any of these big horror franchises or any reboots, uh, they they tend to you know say okay we're gonna ignore everything except for the original one. You know it's like what they did with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre recently, right? Um, you know with the Friday the Thirteenth uh, remake, which I actually think is quite good. Uh, you know so they do they just ignore everything else and then go back to the to the original one. Um, Alien did that. Um. And and I think that's kind of necessary because you know as you continue to try to you just get so muddy with trying to re you know kind of re rehash all the stuff and and there's nowhere for it to go if they just continued what was happening in the show era you know there there would be nowhere for the franchise to go except getting sillier and sillier um, I think in the 80s also horror films they they went one of two ways they were I mean they were all very violent. Which you see in these that that's the Heisei era is is the eighties and and the eighties and nineties. Those movies are very violent. You know, we see Godzilla bleed. Uh, mm. You know, we see we, we see a lot, just a lot more gore and violence in those movies. Uh, but also, you know, I think that in in general, the threats that they were talking about were just kind of more immediately present. Right. Like the threat of nuclear war was right there. You know, the Cold War it was thick with with that fear you know with with the showa era for the most part you know it was the whole thing was it was a look back at what had happened but right. then there's like an optimistic moving forward the heisei era which i like quite a bit that's my personal favorite era they you know they they i think do a good job of, of trying to kind of re- react to the intensity of what was going on globally at the time um the millennium era then you know there, that whole era for me is just kind of characterized by bigger, fancier, you know, more technology. Um, they have to mixed degrees, you know, more computer generated technology. It, it's just it's the Millennium Era is kind of like bigger is better. And once again, they start off uh, very dark and serious. And and even though each movie is is of a more serious nature, I and mean, by the time you get to Godzilla: Final Wars, which is one of my favorites of the whole franchise. It's just absolutely mad, you know. It's just totally insane. Uh, but but I mean, you have something like uh, you know, like Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack, which which is arguably like the scariest one um, mm. since you know it it makes that one makes Godzilla scary again. It's essentially got it's well, it's not essentially it is it's Godzilla possessed by the spirits of the dead that died in the Pacific theater during world war II, And so, you know, you have Godzilla with these white eyes and this big scary snarl and it, it becomes a, a it, it, it's just a, a generally more adult, more frightening um, depiction. Um, so I, I don't know if that's, you know, just due to the franchise getting older. And so they wanted to, they, they wanted to grow older with it. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, the creative teams changing, mm-hmm. you know, where, um, you know, kind of like we see today, it's like when, when we watch a, 
superhero movie from the 80s they are they tend to be funnier lighter all that stuff and then now uh because the the kids that were watching those have grown up no now we have some of these more serious and intense superhero movies so Mm -hmm. i think that that was also partially what was happening was you know the kids that grew up in star wars another example right Mm -hmm. the new the new movies are so serious and so I think that that's also kind of like what happened was these creative teams, just as they were getting older and as they took control of this franchise that they loved, um, they they wanted to make it into the thing that they imagined when they were playing with their toys and, and saying how, OK, let's make the really cool Godzilla now. And it all works. They all have. That's what I love about the franchise is they all have their different flavors. And when people ask me, oh, what movie should I start with? Um, you know, I, I often don't say start with the original. The originals mm. are pretty intense. It's kind of like you know, saying start with Citizen Kane if you want to watch it, you, you <laughs> a know, movie. like a, a movie, you know, it's like, um, like, like with my, uh, my niece, my niece is, uh, uh, she's, she just turned 10 and she, she's into kind of this stuff. Like she loves, you know, Wednesday on, on Netflix and like a nightmare before Christmas. And so I said, let's watch a Godzilla movie. I certainly wasn't going to make her watch the original one, but I did show her Godzilla versus Mothra from the nineties. And she loved it, you know, so it's like you really can. There's so many different flavors here and and you can really pick and choose uh, what what to watch based on what people's certain proclivities are. And I think that's one of the strengths of the franchise. One of those proclivities or one of those um, one of those flavors, actually, would be a better way of putting it is is that of the of like a science fiction genre, because monster movies in themselves and you can correct by all, please correct me if I'm wrong, because there's a, you're the expert here. Feel to me like they're like a separate sub, quite a defined subgenre of science fiction, and the science fiction elements that that come in later, like aliens, like like other planets and things like that. It's it's a really big it's a, it's a shift, you know. It feel so so it re- reveals how the original God from Zilla. You know, you have this one science fiction element, which is this big, big monster, but it's also kind of almost like a fantasy element or, uh, you know, um, uh, an adventure element. I mean, I would, would you, I don't know, would you define King Kong as science fiction? I mean, um, I, I wouldn't. I, I would right. define King Kong as a, as, you know, an adventure movie. It's in the same vein as like Indiana Jones or something right. like that for me. Um, and and I mean, I think there are certainly science fiction elements in in the original Gojira. It's, you know, I mean, you have the oxygen destroyer, you have kind of the mad scientist who is mm. who is creating this thing, you know, and yes, you have um you you have Godzilla, but but even then, I I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's just kind of its own thing. It's like a monster movie. But yeah, I mean, by the time we get to Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, and definitely by Invasion of Astro Monster. I mean, they lean heavily into into uh, science fiction, and and but what I kind of love about about at least with the Godzilla franchise is, for the most part, the science fiction elements they don't focus on them in a way of like trying to really you know make them realistic or like explain things. You know, like you might see in like a Star Trek movie, right, where they're mm. kind of talking about you know how the deflector dish is going to do X Y Z. It's more like, and there's a black hole with aliens around it, and we have a rocket, and we're on the moon, you know? And it's just like, I think as a way for them to expand that universe out and just have more reasons for more monsters of, like, different crazy styles to to come in and, and play in their sandbox. Um, but I, I love it. I mean, it's I, I love how, how wild they get and how kind of, you know, just totally goofy um, the... Uh, uh, how how just totally goofy a lot of that a lot of that stuff gets. I mean the the costumes alone and in Invasion of Astro Monster are like so bonkers. I I still want to someday do a Halloween costume uh, from that. <laughs> Plenty of ideas. Um, yeah. I mean, that, do you think that has something to do as well with? I mean, you mentioned earlier about the sort of Japanese, um, you know, concerns and lens on a certain way, certain cultural norms that Japan has, which makes these these films interesting uh, f- from a from our perspective as well. 
Um, do you think that's also sort of like how story is handled? You know, that it's not they're not going to the same screenwriting classes that we the uh, people in the West or in America or Hollywood are. And and so it's they don't just don't play by the same rules necessarily. And they're sort of like, OK, here's a bunch of aliens and we, we're not going to, as you say, Star Trek it or or fit it into some other template. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. And that's a good point. I mean, I, I think that one, I think you're definitely correct, is that they, especially back then, I mean, they they took a lot of inspiration from from Western movies. You know, they mm -hmm. they took um, I mean, the kind of the whole inspiration for the original Gojira was was like Roger Corman films. You know, they saw these big monster movies with like stop motion animation. It was Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was the mm -hmm. movie that especially um, inspired them to make uh, to make Godzilla in the first place. Um but so they took a lot of inspiration from that. But then I think just culturally in Japan and I might and this is I am being very broad here and I am by no means an expert on Japanese culture. And there's a whole lot more layers and a whole lot more complexity to it, obviously, than what you know I might say. But I think culturally, like like even just, you know, having visited Japan, when you turn on the TV, the the stuff you're watching is to our eyes just completely chaotic and bonkers, you know, and you've got picture in picture of people's faces watching this thing and then like explosions and then it'll suddenly change a scene completely and not have anything to do with what happened before. So I think just like from an entertainment standpoint, they just have a, a greater, um, <laughs> the word is patience for that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, I think they, they more readily and willingly accept um, things that might not be totally logical, you know, whereas a, an American audience might kind of go, ah, you know, cross their arms and, and be like, well, that doesn't make sense. A planet can't revolve around a black hole, whereas Japanese audiences are like, sure, whatever, show me the monsters, you right. know, and, and just and just like fall into it more easily. So I, I think that's definitely a thing that would be an interesting kind of study to do about about, uh, you know, Japanese sensibilities regarding re regarding entertainment uh, from from that perspective. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting. I think yeah, it's funny because we're, we're it's kind of happening at the moment with Netflix and and um, and you know a lot more availability of Japanese and of course Korean and and, and uh, just mm -hmm. international culture, um, or even something like uh, you know I was I'm all, I'm a huge fan of um, Beat Takeshi Katano's work. And then you mm -hmm. realize, you know, uh, made these brilliant gangster Yakuza movies, um, such as uh, um, Violent Cop was one and uh, Fireworks was another. And he and, and yet in Japan, he's famous as a comedian and for being the, the you know, game show guy who did Takeshi's Castle. And it's just like, yeah. You know, it's it's like how does the how do those two things fit together? You know, how does that? You know, I, it's just unbelievable. But at the same time, I mean, what would be the equivalent? It would be like having like Montel Williams make Martin Scorsese movies or something. Sure. Well, I mean, I think we see that though, right? It's like we we see the transition of Jim Carrey from being a silly, you know, rubber faced comedian to doing like the Truman Show or doing you know these uh, uh what was the the movie about like the movie theater that was really serious or, you know, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Bill Murray also, you know, I, so, so we see, we see that happening or even like, uh, you know, in the horror world, like Wolf Creek, Oh, I'm blanking on his name right now, but the gentleman that plays the bad guy in that he's famous for being a big comedian in Australia. He's mm -hmm. like a very famous funny man in Australia and all, and, and all we know him from is, is Wolf Creek where he's, this completely sinister and evil scary character so it you know they all it, it all uh I, I i think that happens kind of in every culture um but maybe maybe the japanese are a little bit more willing to and again this is a big a big overgeneralization but maybe the japanese are a little bit more willing to to accept that more quickly than american audiences are where american audiences are always very or tend to be you know, they, they're pretty judgy, you know, they, mm. they go into something and they're like Robin Williams in a serious role. Well, we'll see about that. You know, and then we <laughs> give them all the awards. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. This, yeah. That's, that's interesting. It's, you know, Japan is such an amazing place and there, I, have you, have you ever been, have you ever been? No, to Japan? no, I haven't. No, it's definitely um, on my bucket list though. 
it's it's an incredible place. I, I had the opportunity to go a number of years ago, and it just really is amazing to see to to step into a world that is one hundred percent different from what you've ever known. Hmm. You know, it, it's you know mostly like if I go to Europe, right? I I still like I I've been to Berlin a number of times, right? And I even though I don't speak German, I walk around. I know what a hot dog stand is. Mm. You know, I can mm. walk into a convenience store and I can, I know what as what soda to get. And I, you know, and I can fudge my way through the, you know, and people speak English, you know, if I need help, you know, and stuff like that. In Japan, it's just, you have none of that. I mean, you'll look at a vending machine and I don't know if something's a coffee or a beer or a, or some weird milk soda that you've never heard of before, you know, and nobody mm. speaks English and you're just kind of like, figuring it out and it's so exhilarating and exciting and i think you know that that sense about japanese culture where they are true like true unique to themselves just shapes their entertainment and their cinema in a way that that is just endlessly fascinating to me yeah absolutely i totally agree with that i think that's a really interesting point because we t we tend to talk about globalization or we used to we don't seem to talk about it anymore but we used to talk about globalization as being you know everywhere is becoming the same but it's such a oversimplification and generalization because you go to different places it's like no nope, this isn't the same this is totally different and so when you come to um like the american uh later remakes when you're you come to people like emmerich i i guess being the first major one um i remember i remember the trailer for um uh emmerich's godzilla the very very first like teaser trailer and it was like um a massive foot crashing down on a t-rex skeleton in the museum mm -hmm. and it was really sort of oh you saw jurassic park you know this is yeah. the king king of monsters what was your what was your reaction to to that Take. Well, I mean, it it that came out in ninety eight, so I would have been mm. uh, fifteen when that came right. out, right? Yeah, fifteen. Um, I loved it when it came mm. out. I I flipped out over that movie. I had the soundtrack. I I know I saw it multiple times at the theaters. As a you know, as an adult looking back on it, and as a Godzilla fan, is it a good Godzilla movie? No. Is it a is it a fun like? Like if Roland Emmerich had just made his own giant monster movie and not called it Godzilla, I think that people would be a lot kinder to that movie. I mean, mm. it's silly, it's dumb, you know. It's there's not much substance to it, um, and and the the I mean, dumb is just sort of the operative word of that movie. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, to me, it's certainly entertaining. You know, the the thing about that movie was the um, the American studios had for a long time been really wanting to make a Godzilla movie, mm. and it. You know, a few there have been a few like stops and starts, you know, throughout the years. But finally, um, when Emmerich was was you know when was given the greenlit to make it, I mean, he admits he was not a fan of the original franchise. He he didn't get it. He didn't like how like the more serious ones, um, you know, and and he just sort of threw everything out the window except for the title Godzilla and the idea that it was a big lizard. And he just, and, and he admits in interviews, he was like, yeah, we just threw everything out and just made our own thing, which is understandably upsetting to Godzilla fans, you know, but I think, I think it, it, that also is a very kind of unique American sensibility of like, I don't care what they did. I'm just going to do my own thing. It's going to be bigger and splashier and we're going to put Matthew Broderick in it and whatever. I do think that the, the legendary ones uh, that are, that are now out, um, I actually like those quite a bit. I think that they are doing a good job. I really love Mike Doherty's uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Um, I don't understand why that one seems to get the most hate out of this new um, this new batch of films uh, because I, I actually I, I really like it quite a lot. Um, I think that it is I think that it it is kind of the best example of what we're able to do with modern technology of showing these monsters kind of the way we all imagined them as kids. You know when you watch. Godzilla versus Mothra, what you're seeing, you know, is not like a photorealistic, you know, whatever, but what you're imagining when you're, you know, I'm holding up like Godzilla, I have Godzilla toys everywhere, but it's like when you play with these toys, what you're imagining in your head is something so much more incredible and grand and, and everything. And I think that he really managed to, to, uh, to capture that with that movie, you know, and the same with like, 
Godzilla versus Kong, you know, they, they leaned into, we are making a big monster brawl. And I think they did a great job at it. I love the reinvention of Mecha Godzilla. You know, what a great villain to bring back and what a great, you know, kind of way to reimagine it for, for a modern audience and to make it actually like scary. Yeah. I mean, I, I like what they're doing and, and, you know, there are some purists that really don't like them and that's fine. Um, you know, but I, I think that for me, as long as it's like different, um, that I'm happy. It's like, I'm, I'm glad like with Shin Godzilla, you know, Shin Godzilla, it comes out and it is so completely 180 from like what they were doing at the end of the millennium era, which I also love, but I'm glad that they came back and they said, no, we're going to, we're going to do this a completely different way and, and still use the icon and the iconography of, of Godzilla to tell a story that is about cultural culture and about the planet. Um, but, but we're going to, we're going to do it differently than you've seen it before. That's what I really appreciate when a filmmaker does that. I muted myself and forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> if, if only that would happen more often, shout the whole <laughs> audience. Uh, uh, the, what you were saying about uh, Godzilla versus Kong. And I, I, I think this also goes for John Wick to some degree is those films are to me actually a uh, 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 proof that some film directors and some um, creatives in Hollywood have soaked up the Japanese model for doing things, or in the case of John Wick, the Hong Kong model for doing things. Of 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 action cinema is just purely about the fights, so we're going to cut out the shit and just have a ninety minute fight, and that's basically John Wick. Although apparently the new one's like three and a half hours long or something. And the same thing with Kong. You know, if you're sitting there waiting for the characters to to somehow have some impact in the story, then you're going to watch. You're going to be disappointed. You know, you have to watch it thinking, no, I just want to see these two monsters fight for as long as possible. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, and, and again, this is a very sort of American take on on the Godzilla franchise. You know, uh, Americans tend to look at the original Godzilla films and go, well, it's just a reason to get two monsters to fight and the human stories like don't really matter, mm. um, which couldn't be further from the truth in the, in the Japanese films. Uh, right. Japanese right. films have quite a lot of human story and they're often really engaging and really interesting. And, and um, you know, that, and a lot of that was from the guidance of Ashiro Honda as he was, you know, really helping guide the franchise in the early years um, that these were human stories where the monsters were elements impacting them. The Americans, you know, have since, you know, sort of taken that and said, well, no, 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 human stories don't matter and make it um, and, and make it all about the fighting. I actually think that, Gareth Edwards and uh, and Murray, I, I actually, you know, people, I, I have heard people complain that there's too much human business in those movies and mm. not enough fighting, and that's why they don't like them. I feel the opposite way, where I like the human stuff, and and I like that it 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 is it is what frames the fighting and why we care about the fighting. With Godzilla versus Kong, though, I am a huge fan of what they did and what you reference of of saying, yep, we are going to give you, you want to see them fight? They're going to fight. Mm. You know, this is, we, we are not going to be making any like really big statements about anything. We're we're going to show, show you two giant monsters and then eventually three giant monsters fighting and it's going to be fucking badass. And that's what it was, you know? And it was great. I saw it three times at the theater. It was like, and even if I wasn't a Godzilla fan, I would have seen it that way anyway, because it's just fun. And that's, and that's a, again, a great thing about this franchise is that, look, if you want like, intense and intelligent social commentary it's got you if you want just a fun afternoon out at the movies seeing some silly nonsense it's got you you know it's a, a flavor for everyone <laughs> back to the flavor this ice cream godzilla <laughs> <laughs> yes which i'm I, lord knows they have i'm sure done many godzilla flavors of ice cream <laughs> absolutely um what about the other sort of legacy of Godzilla outside of the actual Godzilla movies in terms of, I mean, I was thinking of things like um, uh, Guillermo del Toro doing Pacific Rim, which just feels like a Godzilla movie, but it's the other monsters that Godzilla will will fight at some further stage, you know? Um, what do you think of of that sort of how it, how it spilled out in that way? Yeah. I mean, I think that it, it set the stage for, 
this idea, at least in the West, because it was more, I, th- I think it was more of like a, in, in Japan, you know, there, there, there are some stories of like, you know, these giant monsters and they have more of a kind of a, uh, a non, I don't know what you might call it, like a, a more fantastical kind of uh, mythological history than, than maybe we do. But yeah, I think that it, it uh, totally opened up the West's eyes to this idea of like, oh, giant monsters are fun. Um, you know, Godzilla has such an enduring history that sure, like filmmakers like Del Toro, you know, saying, I want to do Pacific Rim. I mean, this is, you know, it's a no brainer. I mean, or you look at like Stuart Gordon with robot jocks, right? Mm. Like same sort of thing, you know, those are mechas, but that again is a Japanese manga creation. So, so we, we have adopted um, in the same way as the Japanese kind of adopted uh, the Western back in the fifties, um, when you know when when like Kurosawa was was making Seven Samurai and stuff like that, have in turn then adopted so many of these Japanese tropes and Japanese ideas because they're awesome, they're fun. Who doesn't like a giant mecha? You know, uh, I mean, Power Rangers. You know, were such a huge cultural thing in the '90s for all of us. Ultraman. You know, uh, Voltron. You know, and and then that like I, I recently I don't know if. This was big over in Europe. Did you all have the show uh, uh, Silverhawks? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've had, we definitely had a bunch of these uh, uh, anime shows that have, have come through, and uh, we, I'm in Italy at the moment, and they're huge fans of things like Captain Harlock and Cat's Eyes, mm. and all yeah. of that stuff is. That's basically their sort of four o'clock to six o'clock viewing in uh, yeah. in, in t- when terrestrial television used to be a thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was and it was the same. Like I, I obviously Saturday cartoons, you know. But like when I think of Silverhawks, which was this kind of a, it was essentially like Thundercats, which has sort of become a lot more famous in the intervening mm. years. But it was the same kind of basic thing. But they had this. It was all about transforming the vehicles to make a bigger vehicle and, and joining together. You know, which is very kind of Voltroni Power Rangery idea. And and all that stuff is is influenced by the Japanese mm. and. And again, it's like, you know, when you ask well, why, why do I think that happened? I, I Again, I just think it's because it's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, we, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's fun. It's good entertainment. It's, and, and it leans into this like non-realistic, you know, we don't have to explain it. We don't have to mm-hmm. explain how the Megazord, you know, worked in Power Rangers. We just have to accept that it did because it was cool. And uh, I kind of went off on a tangent there, but yeah, I think that the, I, 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 I love that we continue in the West to absorb these these this Japanese entertainment. I love that anime is bigger than it seems it ever was. Um, you know, I I teach uh, sometimes at a middle school here in in Texas, and and I, the kids are all about the different anime shows. Right. You know, they know so much more than you know that or like Pokemon is back, and it just goes to show like these are are really enduring symbols. And and every single one of those kids, even if they haven't seen a movie they know who Godzilla is. Mm. And I think that's the thing that is, you know, ubiquitous. It's the same as like, every kid knows who Frankenstein is. Every kid knows who Dracula is. Every kid knows who Mickey Mouse is. Uh, Kids know who Freddy Krueger is. You know, these complete like cultural symbols um, that cross cultural boundaries. Uh, And Godzilla is right there at the top of that list. Uh, you you can't go anywhere in the world without showing like that silhouette of Godzilla. And like if you were in Helsinki, I'm sure they go, that's Godzilla. You know, mm-hmm. if you were in Thailand, I'm sure they go, that's Godzilla. Uh, and that's pretty cool. I mean, that's that's a pretty intense cultural impact. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I mean, yeah, I, maybe I'll go on a tangent a little bit here as well, but. I looking at the modern franchise franchises coming out of Hollywood. I'm talking about the big action movies that are non Marvel. You know, you've got Transformers, which feels uh, is utterly dependent on and feeding into that c- cultural influence. And even something like Fast and Furious, I think they're sort of like utterly unre- joy joy joyfully unrealistic uh, nonsense. You know, let's mm-hmm. just fly across you know cars can just it's basically a, a script written by 11 year old me with my cars co- yes. and, oh now this car can fly off the banister of the stairs and uh you know go to the moon or whatever you know 
that all feels to me very much in that similar sort of vein of high, even if it, it not necessarily consciously, but of of like over the top escapism. Oh yeah, I mean, it's I, I think that's all all of the same general piece. It's it's mm. uh, and I and I love it. It's it's you know like I, I love the Fast and Furious uh, you know re- reference there. It's like you don't you don't need you don't need things to be realistic to enjoy them you know you don't i mean some people do and for some people like you know those movies just don't do it for them because that's not what they're looking for out of a movie and fine that's totally fine um but yeah for me when a movie just really decides to go for it and doesn't care about about any of the sort of normal like tropes that that you would not tropes is the right word but any of the you know kind of normal more serious more uh more realistic avenues it, it, i just i i love it i i don't always need you know a kitchen sink drama i don't mm, you mm. know i i love i love jason takes manhattan just as much as i love hereditary you know they're two mm. different just totally different experiences and i love them for different reasons uh would i ever turn on hereditary at like 3 p.m on a sunday no probably not would i turn on jason takes manhattan yeah any day of the week you know <laughs> anytime <So. laughs> anytime <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, work, works of art sort of just posit their own universe, don't they? And so it, uh, it's it's kind of the ones that go in the middle, which sometimes are the ones that, that perhaps take the flack from both sides. I always think Christopher Nolan's Batman gets um, weird criticisms. It's just like, I remember when Dark Knight Rises came out, by which time he'd established himself as, OK, this is a universe, this is a world. And um, I, I'm a huge fan of them. I love them all. And I was just baffled by people criticizing them because of like, oh, but the length of time it would have taken for him to drop the nuclear bomb and then return. And it's just like, it's Batman. <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. Didn't you see the bit where he was wearing a bat costume? And flying yeah, it feels, like, it feels like such an unfun way to me to watch a movie. Right. You know, or like the people with The Last Jedi that complained, well, why would they drop how could they drop bombs down in space? You know, that doesn't make sense. Or why, you know, why would she do the light year thing to smash the ship into the other ship? Why wouldn't they do that all the time? And it's like, oh my God, everybody calm down. Just like, it's about space wizards. Like, enjoy it. You know, <laughs> exactly. it was a cool, it was a cool moment. It moved the plot forward. Like, you know, it was emotional. Like we don't need to explain everything away. And I think that that's really a, uh, yeah, I don't know. I like I said, I just think that's an unfun way to watch a movie. So that uh, always, to me, uh, I, I just steer away from that. I I utterly agree. I remember there being an argument about one of the Fast and Furious films, which I enjoy. I mean, I'm not a massive fan, a huge fan, or anything like that, but I've watched several and I've enjoyed them. And there was one where there's a huge runway that there's a chase scene and it's all taking place on a runway and they and i think there was even an article in the newspaper about how long is this runway and and it's just like but surely the film itself knows that it's not like they've yeah. sat it's not like they've sat and watched it in the editing suite and gone you know what i think we might be running out a runway they've gone it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just keep yeah. going. And it's it's it you know it, as I say if it was just a little bit too long then that might be a problem. But the fact that it's like three times as long as, a, as the runway could possibly be, that means it's fine. You know? Yeah, it's, it's just, it's, yeah, it's or it's like when you see these YouTube videos of like 30 plot holes in Fast and Furious 7. And it's like, these aren't plot holes. These are, you know, it's not like they were like, oops, didn't, you know, forgot to include <laughs> that. It's like, no, it's like, they're just, they don't care. We're not supposed to care about that stuff. Exactly. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it's silly. People are silly. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, consistency. I mean, Felma Schumacher said it when she was uh, editing uh, Goodfellas. You know, she said some takes are the best takes for the performance and everything, but there'll be a continuity error. There'll be like, he's got the cigarette in the wrong hand or the coffee cup is in the wrong position. But it's the best take in terms of the performance. And you just go... Ah, fuck it. You know, it. uh, People are watching for the performance. They're not. If they're watching the coffee cup, we're screwed. You know, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's definitely a thing. I mean, we. You know, we. I was really concerned about that when I was directing my first movie, Sequence Break. You know, we'd have some moments that would be exactly that. He'd Mm. he'd turn the doorknob with the wrong hand, or he'd 
the water and the glass was of a different level. But pretty quickly, you just start going, yeah, but people are invested in the emotion and in right. the moment. You know, uh, that famous scene in Star Wars where, you know, the stormtrooper hits his head on the door. It's like a, a lesser filmmaker, you know, would have said, oh, we've got to find a take where he doesn't hit his head. As opposed to going, no, this is, the, this is when they're the most urgent. This is the the better take, you know, so we don't, ca- you know, whatever. Who cares about that guy? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think you're you're 100% right. Brilliant. I love being 100% right. Um, listen, <laughs> <laughs> Graham, uh, Oh, actually, just before we, I give you the last question. Uh, the um, how how has uh, Godzilla informed your own uh, filmmaking? Because you're you know you're an actor, you're a director. What what's the what's the connection there? Uh wow, good question. I think the two main things I would say is that especially when you look at the original film, what it's shown me is that you can have you you can make very profound and important statements through fantasy art Mm. that you can have something you know that ostensibly is about you know a giant monster rising from the sea and attacking the city that is also making an important statement about cultural history at the same time it also shows me the importance of having fun in a movie and that you know when i think about what are the movies i like to go back to over and over again they're they're fun you know i want to have fun and they can be serious fun you know, the original Gojira is a, it's a serious movie, but it's fun. You know, mm. there's, there is that element of, you know, that nebulous term fun. What does that mean? You know, um, but it's still, it's still entertaining while also being, being something, something serious. And, uh, and, and so I, I, you know, and, and at the same time that I look at, you know, later Showa era stuff, that's just totally bonkers and ridiculous. And I go, this is also totally valid, you know? Mm. So like in the scripts that I write and in the stuff that, I try to do, you know, it, it varies between being, you know, very intense and serious to being just like totally silly and wild. Um, and I, I love, I love that and everything in between. Uh, and, and so I think just the Godzilla franchise shows me the, the uh, importance of having, of having fun with your filmmaking and also not being afraid to, uh, to make real statements with your fantasy art. Amazing. And the final question that I ask everyone is to recommend a film book, a, a book that you've you've read yourself um, for our listeners. Yeah, interesting. Um, a film book. Well, obviously, I recommend my own book, Godzilla, The Official Guide <laughs> to the King of the Monsters. Um, not, a, not allowed. Not allowed. That's the, that's um, the, whole, the whole podcast is a recommendation of your book. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I really love, let's see, I love If Chins Could Kill. Confessions of a B movie actor um, is Bruce, Campbell. Bruce Campbell's book. Uh, that that was a really big inspiration for me. Um, I just I love that book a lot. Um, there is also another book that is written by Gunnar Hansen about the making of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it is called. I am my I'm trying to get my brain to Texas remember the, Chainsaw Confidential. There it is. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, that book. Uh, fabulous, um, really fabulous. Um, and then there, uh, the last one that I'll recommend that is a, a real personal favorite of mine um, is called The Dark Fantastic, and it's a biography of Clive Barker. Really wonderful book. Clive Barker is maybe the biggest influence on me artistically, just in general. I'm a huge Clive Barker fan. Uh, and this book, The Dark Fantastic, is a is a really a really special book. Um, you know, and even if you're not necessarily a Barker fan or you don't know his work. Um, it's just a, uh, it's, it's a great book about the, about artistic expression and about the artistic experience. Um, so highly recommended. Wow. Th- those are some great recommendations. The Gunnar Hansen one I finished like a few weeks ago. Um, oh, really? I, oh yeah. yeah. It's great, isn't it? It's so good. It's so good. And I was in Texas in June last year and I, uh, went to all of the, the different, you, sort of, you went to them, That's the great. locations, you know, and it was yeah. really a lot of fun. Did but, you, did you eat at the restaurant? Uh, no, I went in and had a drink at the, the, the original house that sort of, they've yeah. sort of moved. Yeah. I went and had a drink and took the photograph and it's still kind of creepy. It still creeps you out a little bit. It's, it's, yeah, it's a little weird. I, I went there, uh, it was during fantastic fest a number of years ago and me and my friend mm. Matt, uh, Mercer went out there and we uh it was fun we walked in and 
I mean, we could see it was the house from the outside, but we walked in and there was like nothing there about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is very weird to us. It's just a bunch of like old people eating lunch. Mm. And uh, and we asked the lady at the front, like sort of desk or whatever, is this the Texas Chainsaw House? And she was like, she rolled her eyes and said, all right, let me go get Tina for you or something. She comes back with this like 18 year old, like goth girl that works there that clearly is the one person that knows everything about it. She's like, okay, let me show you. Come on. This is the where Leatherface steps out. Let's go. This is where she jumps out the window. This is where grandpa was. And, and then of course we had to sit in the dining room, uh, which is the dining room from the movie. Uh, and we, and we had some barbecue and it was yeah. great. It was great. Well, well now they've got, they've, they've definitely, there's a lot of memorabilia. Have they done it up more? Yeah, yeah. It's That's it, good. It's a, a proper place, and they've got models and, and stuff. And, I mean, it's still a working restaurant and a bar, and the, the people sitting there were just locals having a drink, and, and I'm yeah. I'm there, and they were like, do you want to take a photograph? It's like, yes! <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm there on my own, so it's like... Oh, well, I'm sure they can see us coming from a mile away. You know, we're all yeah. wearing, like, a black horror T-shirt, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like, oh, one of those, okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, exactly. Um, and the, oh yeah, and Clive Barker, of course, he, he, I went to Liverpool, was my college town, so. Mm. Um, oh yeah. I, I know Clive Barker from, he's an interesting career, because, you know, he was that, there was that period where he did that film, uh, what was it then, um, Night, Nightcrawlers, was it? Nightbreed? Nightbreed, Nightbreed. Yeah. And it seemed like. I had the feeling when I watched that that oh here we go he's going to go off into the stratosphere and and it didn't quite do that and yet he I mean read wrote amazing books yeah I think that um, he got burnt out I mean yeah. and, and you read about it in the book but I think he got burnt out by Nightbreed I think that right. the experience of dealing with the studio on that was was not a fun one for him but mm. I mean yeah his his books are just like just phenomenal I finally read Imagica which is his like sort of biggest magnus it's definitely opus. his biggest book it's like his magnus opus yeah and, and he uh and i just absolutely loved that i finally you know i it was one summer and i said okay i'm finally going to read this i'm going to read this book because i try you know, it's like this thick you know it's yeah. gigantic um over a thousand pages and uh very rewarding very right. very much well worth it yeah excellent well listen graham thanks so much for um for talking to me and, and congratulations on the book it's an absolute uh Godzilla of a book and, be and beautiful to look at. So loads of great photographs and pictures. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I'm really I so lucky to get approached by Toho to do it. And the, working with them was just fabulous, and um, and uh, couldn't couldn't have asked really for a better a better dream job. I'm very 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 thankful. So that was Graham uh, uh, and I talking. We had a, a wonderful uh, conversation, a wonderful time talking to him. I certainly, as you can tell from the conversation, learned a lot. Um, it certainly broadened my um, it certainly broadened my attitude towards the films. I, I'm, uh, I'm going to definitely root out some of those titles that Graham suggested and give them a watch. Um, and having read the book, of course. Uh, you know, armed with the knowledge uh, behind the monster, the man in the suit, etc. All that's left for me to do is to thank Elliot Atkins for the music. And also, uh, next week we will have a, a, a new guest. Um, he is going to be Stuart Clowens, and he has written a book, Crooked but Never Common, The Films of Preston Sturgis. What an amazing topic and it is a really good book I've already read it and recorded the episode so I can tell you it's going to be a really fun episode I hope you enjoy it but until then take care